Hi, everyone. This is AJ Woodhams with the War Books podcast, where I interview today's best authors writing about war-related topics. Today, I'm here with Steve Kemper, uh, the author of Our Man in Tokyo, uh, an American ambassador, and the countdown to Pearl Harbor. Uh, Steve, how are you today? I'm fine. Thanks. Wonderful. Well, I got to say, I loved your book, and a lot of other people must too, because I had to go to several different libraries in my county to get this book. They were all checked out. When I went to actually get this one copy, it was, you know, when you walk into a library and there's like the featured books uh, section right up by the front desk, it was yeah. right there. And I felt like I had to like beat other people to it. Uh, so I scooped it up. I read it uh, and I loved it. And I'm so excited to, uh, to talk to you about it. Uh, first, can you just tell us your background? And what got you interested in this topic? Well, I've been a, a freelance journalist for about 40 years. And the last 10 years or so of that, I've been writing books of narrative history before I was a, a journalist covering living people. And the last 10 years, I've been focused on the dead. But the same okay. principle sort of applies, research, bringing them, bringing them alive, you know, suspense, tension, conflict. Uh, except that um, they, I can't re-interview them. I have to find other sources to confirm what they say or not. So uh, that's my background. I've written four books. Three of them are, are these natural uh, narrative history books. And the first one was a, a immersion journalism book. Um, so that's my background. And um, it's, it's, it's worked out fine. Yeah. And I, so I've got the list of books that you, you've written that's on the the back cover of your book, it's A Splendid Savage, The Restless Life of Frederick Russell Burnham, A Labyrinth of Kingdoms, 10,000 Miles Through Islamic Africa, Codename Ginger, The Story Behind Segway, and Dean Common's Quest to in Invent a New World. These seem like all completely different topics. <laughs> what, what, what makes you find these topics? And then I guess with you know going into your book with Japan, what, how did you find Japan for this this book? Well, as a freelancer, I was always a, a generalist, not a specialist. That meant I had to find things that uh, were off the beaten track. And that's what interests me the most anyway. Find some something that people are, are not aware of and then make them excited about it. And that's that's essentially what my journalistic career was about. And that's what these books are about. These are the first two uh, historical books were obscure historical figures that were and they were obscure for uh, they should have been better known let's put it that way one was a a great explorer of africa in the 1850s and the other was a sort of soldier of fortune um from america in the late uh, 19th century early 20th century and then of course i have my, the subject of my current book joseph grew who was very well known during his tenure in japan he spent 10 years in Japan as ambassador in the 10 years before Pearl Harbor. He was there when the bombs dropped on Pearl Harbor. So he was very well known at the time. He was in the newspapers all the time. He got recognized on the street when he came home for yeah. furloughs, but he's been forgotten. And, uh, and I thought that was a shame. And I wanted to tell the story of this lead up through the perspective of Gru. And I was able to do that because he left 6,000 pages of a diary that he kept in Tokyo. There were, thousands of dispatches to and from the State Department, his, his personal letters, his speeches, um, scrapbooks that he, that he kept, clipping books that he kept for each year that he was in Japan, coverage of everything happening. So it was a treasure trove for me, and I, I hope I was able to bring him and the situation alive to make the past breathe for the reader and to feel the same stresses and tensions that Gru felt. Oh, that's really great. Uh, well, I think you did. Like I said, it was a, it was a great read. Um, so your interest really then is so you came across his diary. And you were like, "Wow, this is this is a fascinating guy." No, what happened is, uh, in a, to give credit, <laughs> I read a book called "In the Garden of Beasts" by Eric uh, Larson, which is love about that the, book. It's a great book uh, about the yeah. American ambassador to Berlin in the early 1930s as Nazism was just starting to poke its ugly head into ge into uh, German politics, and I finished that book and it was so fascinating to read about this 
culture going insane um, that I thought, who was our man in Tokyo? And that's what yeah. me Joseph grew. Oh, well, and aptly named uh, the book, Our Man in Tokyo. That never changed. <laughs> it's, it's a, it's yeah, <laughs> uh, that's wonderful. Uh, well, let's dive into the book. So the book starts in, I believe, in 1932. It's almost 10 years leading up to, to Pearl Harbor. Uh, can you just give the audience some context? What was going on in, in the world at this time? And then what was going on in, in Japanese society at this time? Well, what led to Guru's appointment in 1932 was the invasion by the Japanese army of Manchuria in 1931. And the Japanese army did that without seeking permission from the civilian government in Tokyo. So Hoover, Hoover saw this and thought, this is, this is alarming. We have, we, have a, we, we have what seems to be a rogue aggressive force starting to operate in Asia. And we need our best diplomat to go there uh, because it's the, the most stressful place in the world right now. And our best diplomat was Joseph Grew. So that's why he got appointed. As the 1930s wore on, Germany became equally, if not more alarming. But um, in 32, it was Japan. And so that's why Grew went there. Now, Japan at the time, and, and I, I was surprised by a lot of the things that I found in my research. I, I Like a lot of Americans, I tend to know more about the rise of Nazism and in Germany than I do about what was happening in Japan in the 1930s. My knowledge about Japan essentially starts with Pearl Harbor. And what I found was chaos, violence, coup attempts, paranoia. That was a seething mass of frantic uh, Im imperialist ambition. And so very rich material, but this is what Gru stepped into and he was supposed to sort things out and try to bring uh, Japan back into the fold of the Western nations. Yeah. And similar to you, I also, one of the reasons why I really like this book is my knowledge of World War II is also mostly uh, European, you know, what was going on in, in that part of the world. And I, I knew very little in the lead up to uh, the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And I too was, was, was shocked at the chaos uh, I went. I think I went. I went to the the Wikipedia page for prime ministers in Japan because I kept in your book. I kept reading all these different names. Every other chapter, there was a new prime minister. It felt like, and there were like fifteen from from the nineteen thirties leading up to the end of World War II, which which is incredible. But yeah, like you said, it's it it really came off to me as a time that was tumultuous. That assassinations the, the book starts off with the assassination of a, a prime minister i believe mm. and it really just a a chaotic scene that i i had no i had no idea about well paint a picture then of of joseph grew of ambassador grew u.s ambassador to to japan at, at this time like you said he was very recognizable or he was very well known and even he would get recognized on the street, which I guess in the world of diplomacy is something that's very, not every diplomat uh, gets that, that kind of, that kind of fame. Tell us about Joseph Grew. Uh, what was he like? What was his, his background and what were some of the things that made him special during this very kind of chaotic, tumultuous time? He was, Born in Boston to Boston Brahmins, he had a, a wealthy, privileged upbringing. He went to Groton and then to Harvard, like his father and his brothers had. And when he got out of Harvard, he was expected to go into Boston business or banking, as the family tradition decreed. But instead, he told his dad, that idea bores me to death. I can't do it. And his father was appalled and said, well, you can have a year to have a kind of a wing ding abroad. But when you come back, and you get this out of your system, you'll go into the, the proper place. Well, he went to the Far East. He didn't take the usual tourist leisurely trip. He went to the Far East. He climbed mountains. He hunted big game. He got malaria. He, and all this, what all this did was intensify his desire for adventure and for living in foreign places. And so he came home and told his father, it's going to be the State Department, not State Street. His father was appalled, but eventually accepted it and grew, ended up in what was um, not a professional service at that time. It was a a privileged class of people who were appointed by 
it was patronage, all patronage jobs. So Gru had to find a patron. He eventually did and went to his first post in Mexico City. He served in 14 posts. Um, he helped usher in the professionalization of the, of the Foreign Service. And for that reason, he's known as one of the fathers of, of the Foreign Service. Although we didn't get rid of patronage jobs, which he deplored for the rest of his life, because uh, we know where that goes. And he worked his way up through various ambassadorships until finally he was appointed in Japan. And that's what happened. He, he, he left behind a life of privilege and leisure, comparatively, for a life of adventure and serving his country in foreign places. He was devoted to that idea. Yeah, I was also surprised at, although, you know, uh, uh, to be an ambassador is obviously, um, you know, that's a very uh, prestigious thing. Um, but I was surprised that back at this point in time in American history, early 1900s that these are patronage jobs and you know it was a very kind of elitist group of people who who were the ambassadors um so i also found that surprising uh tell me a little bit about uh, joseph grew's personality i loved you you had a quote uh, later on in the book uh, about grew whereas a pessimist finds difficulty and opportunity an optimist finds opportunity in difficulty. I hope that's your quote, um, because that was very profound. And you were speaking about Ambassador Gru's um, attitude towards how he was going to work with, with the Japanese. So I, I definitely got the sense here and, and throughout the book that this, this guy's an optimist. Uh, he's, you know, he's working hard to, to prevent war. And he's, 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 a, very, he's um, a positive person, maybe. Um, but tell us a little bit about about the man and, and his personality. Well, that was a quote from Gru, by the way. Uh, okay, <laughs> and he was describing himself. So, oh, great, yeah, even he better. Was, he, he was an optimist by nature, uh, and that often got mistaken. Uh, I'm afraid for uh, being soft. He wasn't soft. Um, he wanted to find, as he thought an ambassador always should, opportunities to improve relations. So that's why even up all the way through the 30s into the 19, early 1940s, when Hull, Secretary of State Hull, was uh, just convinced that J the Japanese could never do anything uh, that would be trustworthy or a movement towards peace, grew, kept finding opportunities to to wedge diplomacy back into what was going on. It didn't mean he was naive or, or soft. It just meant that he was, in his view, a good diplomat because you never give up. You never give up on the idea of peace. That's his main job as a as a as an ambassador. So he was he was he was certainly an optimist. He was um, diplomatic even in his diary. There's no scurrilous anecdotes in his diary. There's nothing. There's some occasionally some irritation, a couple of times there's anger, but never anything, um, you know, never anything juicy, I guess you could say, uh, because he thought that his diary would be useful to f historians in the future, and he didn't want to go outside the diplomatic channels that he had created for himself. Um, so I, I, I consider him, and he was also, by the way, uh, devoted to the idea that an ambassador should be empathetic to the country where he's posted that you have to go in there trying to understand their point of view their needs their motivations because if you don't there aren't then you're not going to be able to make any headway you have to understand what they're what they're going through and thinking and and secondly if you don't come in with that attitude they won't trust you so that they, they will not um, open up with what they really want they won't trust you when you say that i might be able to get that for you so he was um, really an ideal diplomat, in my view. Yeah, I, I mean, I definitely got that sense throughout throughout the book, not just with his interactions in Japan with other Japanese diplomats and, and other diplomats from around the world, but even somebody from, you know, he's he's got this privileged background, he's from Harvard, even somebody with that kind of background, I loved the anecdote where he's with Babe Ruth. And they, Babe Ruth's like drinking a boiler maker. He's having a, a shot and a beer. And 
Ambassador Gru is 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 living it up with him. You know, I love that that kind of dynamism that was in his personality, which probably made him such you know an effective diplomat. Is you just kind of get the sense that people liked him, people enjoyed being around him. You're you're absolutely right. People liked him, uh, even though anti-Americanism grew and became very poisonous during the 1930s. It was it was very rarely ever directed at Gru because the Japanese understood he was trying to understand them. So uh, he somehow escaped that yeah. because he tried to be a diplomat. Uh, and he, he was also gregarious. He was charming. He was handsome. Uh, he liked people. Uh, he talks about his social calendar. Um, and he says at one point that, thank goodness, it, it has, has uh, sort of gone down a little bit. And me, then he lists about 20 different social occasions that he had that month because that was a light schedule for him. So he liked being with people. He liked to uh, get to know them. He thought that was an important thing for an ambassador to do. Uh, and people liked him in return. Yeah. Well, you, you talk about when Ambassador Gru first went to, to Japan. He had to learn a lot about Japanese culture. And I also found myself learning a lot uh, from your book about uh, Japanese culture. What were some of the things that in a, an ambassador in, in the 1930s going to Japan, what, what are some of the things that an ambassador would, would have to learn about Japanese society? Well, that's a big one. Uh, the first thing, of course, for an ambassador, the main thing is where are the levers of power and influence? What do, where, who do I approach if I want to influence policy, change policy, have any effect? And in Japan, it was really hard to find those levers of power because there were so many of them. You had the, the Diet, which was the parliament. Japan was a parliamentary democracy at that point. Um, so you had the elected Diet, upper house, lower house. You had the cabinet, which was very important and powerful. You had the palace because Japan had what they considered a divine ruler, Emperor Hirohito, who was supposedly the commander in chief and the head of state. Yet he had almost no power because since he was divine, he wasn't allowed to make any decisions because if, if he starts, you know, when you start making decisions, you're going to start making mistakes. Well, gods can't make mistakes. So the way to cut out the mistakes is to give him no chance to make any decisions, which is an odd thing. And yet the, the emperor's desires, wishes, as communicated through his palace officials and other advisors, carried weight. And then, of course, you had the military, which became hugely important and influential during the 1930s. And their right wing codependents, a lot of patriotic societies, they were called, who uh, wanted to influence the government towards the militaristic uh, stance that became more and more prominent in the 1930s. So Gru's trying to figure all this out. There was no, there was no Fuhrer. There was no Il Duce. There was many different tunnels and, and, and a maze, and Gru had to figure out contacts, who to talk to, who to believe, and that's what he tried to do. Talk a little bit more about the emperor, because I actually knew also very little about Japanese society and, and their their reverence towards the the emperor. Maybe talk a little bit about the idea of of the emperor in Japan, but also I'm I'm kind of curious about Emperor Hirohito as a person too. What were what were his views? If we know what were his views on 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 the West on as we approached war. Um, you know, was he a hawk? Was he a nationalist? Was he a very right wing kind of person? Talk a little bit about the the emperor. He's a very controversial figure, and most people are familiar with him from the war. And during the war, <clears throat> he was faithful to his country. He became more hawkish. He supported the military because that's what you do if you're a patriot and your country is at war. Before that, though, in the 1930s, it seems very clear to me that he was, he tended to have Western sympathies. He, he ate a, an English breakfast almost every morning of his life because uh, he, he was 
an Anglophile, uh, an Anglophile. He he liked the United States. He wanted better relations with the United States. He sometimes instructed his new prime minister that you will appoint a foreign minister who wants better relations with the West, not someone who wants to undermine them. So he he showed signs to me, at least in the 1930s, of of alarm at the way his country was going. And yet he eventually got sucked into the plans of the militarists. So he's he's a compli complicated guy. He was a weak man, I think. He, he was a scientist. He liked to spend his free time studying marine organisms in his lab because he wasn't allowed to make any decisions. So he, he looked for things to do. He, he very rarely left the palace grounds because if you're a, if you're a god, you don't you don't do that that much. Most Japanese never heard his voice until his, his surrender speech in 1945. Grun knew him. He, you know, he had uh, went to dinners there. He he met him many times, of course. And his impression of him was that he was an odd man with some tics. Uh, he you know he seemed he had certain tics. He had a very high voice, and yet he was considered a direct descendant of the first emperor who was sent down by the sun goddess. 2,600 years earlier. So, and from that first emperor were descended the entire Nippon race, the entire Japanese race. So everyone in Japan had a little bit of divinity in them because they were all descended from this first divine emperor. Uh, and the story uh, said 2,600 years, but the story was, was first fomented about a century before. So yeah, I remember was, reading that. <laughs> so, um, you know, it, it it gives you some sense of how odd the culture is. Uh, he and Guru understood that the Japanese would do anything that their emperor asked them to do. People in D.C. thought that economic sanctions would work, the oil embargo might work, that all these different things that we tried might bring Japan to its knees. And Guru kept telling them, "No, you don't understand the Japanese. They will fight until they are using sticks against." Our bombs. No one will surrender until the emperor says it's time to surrender. Yeah, and I've heard stories of even after the war ended, going all the way up to like the 1970s, where Japanese soldiers were still, you know, doing as they they were they were instructed to do. They weren't surrendering. They were still hanging out, um, guarding whatever hill that they were told during the war to guard. 20 mm. years after the war ended. Mm. And it's, it's, it's a really fascinating culture with, you know, it's so strange as, as Americans, of course, um, we don't have an emperor and to the, to have that kind of reverence was, was something that I found very interesting to, to learn about in your book. Talk to me a little bit. So we've, we've got the emperor here on, on one hand, and you've you kind of you mentioned this earlier. You've got the military. Uh, on the other hand, uh, tell us a little bit about the military situation in in Japan in the uh, the nineteen thirties. What what walk us through kind of the the progression from nineteen thirty two to the the end of the decade with what was going on with the military. The, the military right wingers, which tended to be hot headed young officers saw Japan's divine destiny to rule Asia. And so they were always looking for ways to expand Japan's territory. They started with Manchuria. They moved down into the five northern provinces of China, eventually fomented a conflict there. Then eventually they, they, they started the Sino-Japanese War, a devastating war that most Americans don't know about, that claimed millions of lives and sucked Japan dry financially and economically. The, the military started demanding and got 50% of Japan's budget uh, to, to finance these, these plans. Um, they, the Japanese people suffered because of this. The, they couldn't get polished white rice. It all went to the military. They couldn't get clothing, textiles. They couldn't get metal products. They couldn't get uh, food, fish, fresh fish, fresh meat. Uh, fresh anything. Um, most of it went to the to the military. Um, 
the Japanese were told to sacrifice because this was what the emperor wanted. It was for the emperor, and therefore you must comply. And they did. So they got more and more greedy. They went, uh, the Sino Japanese War started, and then they went into northern Indochina. Once, once the, the, the war started in Europe, they went into northern Indochina. Then they went into southern Indochina. And we were each, each step of the way, the United States and other Western powers were telling them, you need to stop. Don't do this again. Here's what's going to happen if you do it again. And then they would. And then there would be some consequence. And the Japanese would go, why did you do that? What did we do? We're the victims here. Why are you doing this to us? We're the poor Japanese. It was uh, an, abs an absurd wheel of um, frustration for Gru and for people trying to deal with this. And what were some of the, so Ambassador Gru, expert diplomat, and it seemed like crisis after crisis uh, that he was dealing with, but tell us a little bit about how he managed that situation and, and some of these crises that, that he had to deal with. Well, let's start with, let's move right on up to 1937. There was an actual coup attempt by the right, the right wing within the military. They assassinated the Lord Keeper of the Privy Seal, the, the Emperor's main political advisor in the palace. They assassinated a couple of military officers that they thought were impeding the move, the movement into greater Asia. They assassinated a bunch of people on, in like February 1937. And so Gru, he, there was not much to do about that. He, he was hopeful that that would create revulsion against the military and maybe lead to something better for diplomacy. It did not, um, but the, the military finally woke up and they put these rebels against the wall and shot them. And so the Japanese public said, oh good, now the crisis is over. Well, it just, it just made the army stronger because it made the people trust in them even more. Then in 1939, when the Sino-Japanese War began, there was a, a, a huge crisis in December as the Japanese approached Nanjing, the capital of the Chinese Republic, um, Chiang Kai-shek's forces were, were driven out. The Japanese took Nanjing. And while they were doing so, there was a, a U.S. gunboat, the USS Panay, which was on the Yangtze to protect U.S. interests along the Yangtze River. To back up a little bit, there was something called the open door policy in, in China at that time. It was uh, several European powers, plus China, plus Japan, had agreed that China would be um, an independent country, but would be open to commercial development by all of these nations who had signed the open door policy. So that's why we had a gunboat on the Yangtze to protect American interests. Well, that boat went about 30 miles up the Yangtze to get away from the Japanese invasion of Nanjing. Nevertheless, Japanese Navy planes bombed the Panay and sank it despite there being stars and stripes uh, on the flagpole, painted on the sides, draped across the decks, massive flags. And then army, gun, army boats came up to the Panay and machine gunned and went on board looking for survivors. Meanwhile, the Navy planes were also strafing the people who had jumped off the Panay, attempting to find uh, refuge in the weeds. So several Americans died, 30, 30 were wounded, something like that. And Gru started packing his bags. He thought this was going to be a declaration of war. But he also was working his diplomacy. And eventually, with, with Hull and Gru and the foreign minister of Japan, who was appalled that once again the army and the navy had gone off the leash, they worked it out. And so war was averted. Uh, and, you know, I can go on. I mean, there's there's just things like that constantly. When, when you mentioned how many... Prime Ministers of War, well, Gru dealt with 17 foreign ministers in 10 years, 17. The cabinets kept falling. Gru would, towards the end of the 30s, early 40s, when a new foreign minister would come in, Gru would hand him a, a, a portfolio of offenses against U.S. citizens and U.S. properties in China. And by 1940, that, was, that list had over 300 incidents on it. Uh, I had no idea about that. Um, that the, the Japanese were that provocative uh, and continued to be said, said, Oh, we said, Oh, we're so sorry. We're so sorry. We'll investigate it. And if, and if it's our fault, we'll pay recompense. They always investigated. They always found there was absolutely no responsibility 
on, on the part of the Japanese, that there was some reason it was the other people's fault. Uh, and so that's what Gru was dealing with, too. He was constantly trying to, to say, you need to stop this. It's if you don't understand that the United States eventually is going to get tired of this and you're you're going to suffer when that happens. Now, what was uh, talk a little bit about. So um, this is another thing I found very fascinating, because on one hand, Ambassador Groves, he's he's like you said, working diplomacy with uh, with the Japanese and, and all these different players, um, these different cabinets navigating the, the military situation. Then on the other hand, um, back in the U.S., uh, he's also he's 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 coming up against a lot of obstacles with the State Department and specifically with the Secretary of State, Cordell Hall. Talk a little bit about the, the relationship between Ambassador Gru and Secretary Hall and just the larger kind of uh, tension between between him and, and the State Department. Well, Hull came in with, with Roosevelt uh, as his Secretary of State, and he he was a very he was a patient man. He was thoughtful and very highly principled. Uh, and Gru appreciated his high principles until they became impediments to any sort of negotiation with Japan. Gru was very flexible. He was a very practical-minded political player. Whereas Hull uh, tended to insist upon principles, um, and that was that was fine until it until it didn't work anymore. Um, so as the '30s wore on, Gru became a little frustrated with with Hull and with his his chief advisor on the Far East, a man named Stanley Hornbeck, who thought that the Japanese could not be trusted because they. <laughs> because they kept breaking every promise that they made and refusing to comply with any definitions of, of, of the way to, the way to even the way to do war. J Japan sort of initiated this bombing of civilians, which became, which became common on both sides um, during world war two. But Japan started that uh, in, in China. Um, so Gru was, as I'm, as I said, I'm backing up a little, he was frustrated. He would, he would propose, possible avenues for diplomacy, Hull would say, okay, go ahead and try it. And then he wouldn't respond to what, what Gru had found out or what Gru had discovered. So the, the, the worst example of this, um, the most frustrating for Gru was this proposal in the late summer, early fall of 1941 by the prime minister of Japan, Prince Konoye Fumamaro, to meet secretly with Roosevelt in U.S. territory to try to come to some agreements to prevent war, which seemed to be on the horizon. Gru was very excited by this idea, um, of course, um, because it had never been, no prime minister of Japan had ever left Japan. Uh, and the way Japan had been acting, there was, there was nothing like this had come from them at all. So Gru wanted this to happen. And Secretary Hull smothered it. He he proposed uh, so many preconditions all based upon high ideals that uh, re re would require Japan to do X, Y, and Z before we would even consider a meeting. And Gru kept saying, don't impose the conditions, meet first and see what they have to say. If it's, if, if it's nonsense, we can return to what we were doing before. And Hull thought that that would be a loss of prestige. He, he didn't think that, that Konye would be able to keep any promises that he made because for good reason, he didn't trust the Japanese to keep any promises. So that possibility died in the crib. And Prince Konoye resigned. General Tojo took over. And a couple months later, we had Pearl Harbor. Now, was Secretary Hull, was, did he have a tense relationship with most ambassadors? Or, or from, from your research, was this... Was the tension specific to Ambassador Gru? No, and I wouldn't even call it tension. Okay. Gru respect, Gru respect, they respected each other. It's just that Gru, he was frustrated by some yeah. of Hull's decisions. And, uh, you know, and, and the other thing to mention here is that Hull and Roosevelt had what 
we had broken, the Americans had broken the Japanese diplomatic code in an operation called Magic. So Hull and, Ro and Roosevelt were reading all the diplomatic traffic between Tokyo and Washington, Tokyo and Berlin, Tokyo and everywhere, so that we knew exactly what uh, Japan's strategy was diplomatically. We knew what they were proposing and what they were really planning. Uh, and Gru did not know that because um, Hull felt it was too dangerous to inform him of it in case Japan had broken our codes or was intercepting our diplomatic pouches. So it was much too valuable a resource to endanger by telling Gru. So Hull had the information that Gru didn't have. Gru had information that Hull didn't have. And of course, you're going to believe the information you have more than what you're being told by, as Gru called himself, the man on the spot. Yeah. And several times uh, you talk about how Ambassador Gru felt very out of the loop from um, the State Department. He would often learn about events from either the uh, other diplomats he was talking to or, or some other channel rather than from the State Department uh, itself. And I ask about the, the tension between Secretary Hall and Ambassador Gru and, and other ambassadors because you, 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 you write in the book about how Secretary Hull did not come from this, this privileged class that, that a lot of the ambassadors came from. Um, he did not, he wasn't a, an Ivy League graduate. And, you know, he didn't, uh, as far as I understood, he didn't kind of hang around in, in these more elite circles. And I wondered when I was reading how much that colored the relationship um, between him and, and the, the diplomatic corps. Uh, or maybe maybe it didn't. It's a good question, I, I, and I, yeah, I'm sure that it did. Uh, Gru was he he did what he could to overcome his class biases as a Boston Brahmin. He really did try to overcome them, and of course he wasn't successful. None of us ever are of overcoming all of our biases. But he didn't ever mention anything in his diary or his dispatches, like uh, you know you're 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 a hick. Or you, you know, you just trust me, I'm smarter than you. He never, there was never a, even a whiff of that in anything that I, that I read. So I think the tension was mostly about how to approach Japan. And um, Hull did not have, not only did he not have a, a background in, in an Ivy League background, he didn't have an, a background in diplomacy. He was an expert on trade, um, international trade, which was perhaps not the best training for somebody coming into the volatile 1930s. But on, on the other hand, I, I got to hand it to Hull. He was very patient with the Japanese. He didn't, he, he resisted the Hawks in FDR's cabinet who wanted to several times go to war with Japan and, and he fought them off. He kept negotiating with Japan um, right to the end. He kept trying to figure out a way to stop this. That was partly because he didn't want war, partly because he thought the United States public would not accept a war because we were very isolationist at that point. And third, because he didn't think the U.S. military was ready for a war yet. Uh, and we weren't. We, our army was in bad shape. Our Navy was, had finally started to come back um, into shape um, because of FDR's uh, pushing that. So there were many reasons why. What were, yeah, what were some of the reasons that Roosevelt's cabinet were pushing for war? Well, the, the things I've mentioned, Japan was bombing U.S. territory. Japan was bombing civilians. Japan was taking territory despite clear warnings. Don't do that or there will be consequences. So <laughs> Hull was, was one of the cooler heads in that cabinet. Would you say the appetite for, if you want to call it appetite, would you say the appetite for, for war was stronger when it comes to Japan? Or uh, when it or or stronger in joining the European conflict. I, I don't I don't think I feel confident enough to answer that. I, I think the two those two totalitarian governments operating at the same time whittled away at the U.S. sense of isolation. Americans were were appalled by the the bombing of London. By, and of course, by the, the takeover of, of Europe, but the way the Nazis were treating the Jews, the way the Nazis were treating, bombing the British, uh, 
And then you had the same thing on the other side. I think more Americans were interested in a war um, on Britain's side than they were interested in a, in a war against Japan. It's a natural thing. There were there were more people with with backgrounds that came from Europe. They, they were they were closer to us in in many ways than Japan was. And so I think that I think the 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 sense was if we're going to enter a war, let's do it for Britain, not far against Japan for Asia. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about Japan and Germany and and their relationship. So throughout your book, you I, you get the feeling that I mean, there are in within Japanese politics, there are people who admire Hitler and admire Germany um, in the early 1930s. And that really you really get a sense that that really grows um, throughout the decade, uh, tell us a little bit about the relationship between Japan and Germany, um, and then ultimately why why Japan decided to to ally itself with Germany. Well, that was one of the another surprising thing to me. I I thought that Germany and Japan were joined at the hip from the start, and they were not. They had a, a very peculiar relationship throughout the 30s and early 40s. As you said, there were there were many in the Japanese military who were enamored of the totalitarian model and, and Hitler's territorial ambitions. That's what, exactly what they wanted for Japan. But there were also politicians, prime ministers in particular, and even uh, uh, ministers of the Navy at, up through much of the 1930s who did not want to join Germany because they thought that Germany would pull them into a European war. Japan had its own agenda, which was Asian. So they, they resisted Nazi and right-wing Japanese pressure to say, yes, we'll join you in a military alliance. And what if, if you go to war, we will go to war with you. Japan didn't do that until um, they never did that, in fact. They resisted that. Um, so, and yet they were close. And Japan wanted to use Germany because Germany was going to make it easy to take the, the Asian colonies of the European powers, Germany, because Germany had conquered them. So the colonies of France, the Netherlands, and Britain looked like easy pickings for, for Japan. That was good. Uh, and Germany wanted to use Japan to help in its war. They wanted, they kept pressuring Japan, bomb, you need to, you need to uh, invade Hong Kong. You know, you need to in, invade Malaysia. You need to go in and help us to relieve pressure on us. And then they lied, they, well, they deceived, I guess you could, you could say. They were some, Germany and Japan were, had signed the anti comintern Pact, which was a pact against communism. J Japan hated communism because the communists had overthrown a czar and, you know, this imperial ruler. So they didn't want any communists coming into Japan to touch their divine emperor. And they thought that they had a, commonality of against the USSR. And, and then G Germany made a, a pact with, with, with the USSR, which allowed them to invade Poland and start the war. And that just shocked Japan. And then, and then they didn't tell Japan they were going to invade Russia. Germany, of course, betrayed Russia, invaded Russia. And that shocked the Japanese, and then they didn't know what to do. Should we invade Russia, Japan's old enemy, and help Germany, or should we continue our plans to move south and take over the rest of South, Southeast Asia? So there was, it, and it was all this complicated calculations on both parts. Japan did not tell Germany that they were going to bomb Pearl Harbor. You know that was that was news to to Germany. So it was they were allied. But their, their alliance was basically to overthrow the status quo, the democratic status quo of Europe and the United States. So, that, so then that's what drew Japan to Germany as opposed to France or Britain or any of the, um, the allied powers. These were democracies and, and Japan was opposed to that. Absolutely. That was a, one of the Western ideas that the right wingers thought had polluted the Japanese way of life. If you if it, it, it's so odd, you have this divine emperor and this this parliamentary democracy. 
they're in total conflict with each other, those two ideas. And the militarists wanted to get rid of democracy and return to what they considered uh, the good old days, make Japan great again, go back to our divine emperor when things were good. Talk a little bit then about, so we're, we're in like the late, uh, so Germany has invaded Poland, World War II has started. What is, what's Japan's attitude now for what they want their involvement to be kind of leading up to Pearl Harbor in this one year, two year span of time? What are, what are their ambitions? Their ambitions are to take over Asia, to rule it, um, to control all of the resources of Asia and to add to the Japanese empire. It, it's pretty simple. Uh, and this was even the moderates um, in Japan who wanted good relations with the West, they bought into that vision as well. They, they thought that the U.S. just stay on your side of the Pacific, we'll stay on our side of the Pacific, and everything will be fine. Um, and, of course, that's, that was not acceptable to the United States or to the European powers. So you write a little bit about Ambassador Gru and how he he did not take so about a year before Pearl Harbor, he passed on information to the State Department that Pearl Harbor could be targeted. Now he didn't he didn't take this seriously, and the State Department didn't seem to to take it seriously either. Why do you think that was? Well, because militarily it was a little bit preposterous uh, to think that that Japan, which is far far away from Pearl Harbor, from, from Hawaii, that they would be able to mount an operation that we wouldn't detect. That's the first thing. It, it would be a very difficult thing to do. Second, why would they dare to attack us, the mighty United States, this little, this little island kingdom? Uh, and they thought that the far more likely military targets would be the British colonies, um, the wealthy British colonies in Southeast Asia, so Hong Kong especially. Um, and so they discounted it, and so did our military. Our military considered it and thought it was very unlikely that it would be something else first, or that we would, even if they attempted it, we would detect it. And even if they attempted it, they couldn't possibly succeed because it would be too difficult to pull off. Of course, they had a genius who was designing that plan, Yamamoto. And it was possible. So we messed up. I mean, we, we, we misread it. The group felt like everybody he did warn it that towards the end of 1941, he said, I can't, I no longer have good contacts. They don't allow us to get um, to see what they're doing, but they are liable to attack the United States and they're liable to do it suddenly and without warning and don't discount that possibility. And Hornbeck, Hull's major advisor on the Far East, ridiculed that idea for months uh, before Pearl Harbor um, because he didn't believe it could happen. On the other hand, Gru kept telling the Japanese, if, if, if you don't stop this, what you're doing, the United States will throw off this sheepskin and become a lion, and you have no, ch you have no chance against that lion, and you must know that because we're far bigger we have far more resources and you can't win. The Japanese discounted that. They thought that um, the ice, that America was too isolationist, that, that the public would not allow FDR to go to war. So he was talking to both in both directions and neither side was believing what he had to say. So why do you think then um, Japan ultimately decided on attacking Pearl Harbor as opposed to like the Philippines or, or some closer... American target. Well, they did attack them at the same time. I mean, that's a they. The Pearl Harbor was just one tan of the fork of that plan. They attacked Guam. They attacked Hong Kong. They attacked everything. You know, around this around the same time, their idea was hit America hard, devastate the fleet, make frighten America, and they will come to the table and negotiate and give us what we want in Asia. And then we'll both go on our, on our ways. Every time they did a war 
war planning in Japan with the, the Navy, the, the Army, all the war planners said, we can last a year, maybe two years, and after that, we'll be overwhelmed. They knew they couldn't go into a, a long war. So they wanted to cripple the United States, scare them, get them to the negotiating table, and solve the issue that way. So, Americans aren't like that. I mean, that's not the way it's going to work. Sure. So tell me then about, um, let's say, we'll, we'll do like a month before, a week before, and day of Pearl Harbor. Tell me about Ambassador Grew and what his immediate, uh, his immediate focus was. Uh, he got more and more pessimistic about what was up ahead, but he kept looking for ways to get around that pessimism and find some kind of avenue. Um, and he couldn't. Um, so I'll tell you about the day of the Pearl Harbor attack, because that's pretty dramatic. He, the night before Pearl Harbor, the night before Pearl Harbor, FDR sent a telegram to Hirohito, a direct communication to the leader of Japan, saying, we need to stop what seems to be about to occur. We are the two leaders of our country. We can stop this. Let's do it. Because the war makes no sense for either of our countries. The Army Telegraph Office held that telegram for 10, 10 hours before giving before Gru got it. It wouldn't make it didn't make any difference at that point because the, the Japanese ships and planes were they'd already gotten their orders. But anyway, it, at midnight, Gru took that telegram over to the palace, um, over over to rather the, the the foreign minister and said, I need to deliver this to the emperor as soon as possible tomorrow morning. Can you arrange it? And the foreign minister knew that the planes were on their way, but he said, yes, I will arrange that. Um, so the next morning, Gru got up and he had an urgent message from the foreign minister, come see me right away. And he thought, well, that was quick work. I guess he's figured out, get, got me an appointment with the emperor. He went over there and the foreign minister, whose name was Togo, handed him uh, a document saying the negotiations are over. Thank you for your efforts. Nothing about war, nothing about that. Uh, the bombs had, Pearl Harbor had been hit hours before. So Greer went back and thought, well, we'll just have to start over. We'll, you know, we'll find, I'll figure something out. He put on his golfing clothes. He was going to play golf. He's about to leave. And he hears the newsboys out in the street calling the headlines, Japan bombs Pearl Harbor, declares war on the United States. That's how he found out about it. <laughs> that's, in, I, that's incredible. I mean, it's on one hand, uh, you know, I guess this isn't, this is a time before, you know, the, the internet or, you know, cell phones or, or whatever. But the fact that he was putting on golfing clothes while, you know, ships were sinking in Pearl Harbor uh, is, mm -hmm. um, is really incredible. Diplomatically, tell me about what, is there anything that, that could have been done differently on Ambassador Gru's end to prevent the bombing of Pearl Harbor? Well, of course, that was the question he asked himself. Uh, he was he and the rest of the embassy staff were interned in the embassy for nine months while negotiations occurred to try to free their our diplomats and Japan's diplomats and make an exchange. And that's that's all he thought about for much of that nine months. How could is there anything I could have done? Um, and he decided he had done everything he could. He had failed, but he had tried everything that he thought he could. And so he felt peaceful about that and terrible about the fact that he had failed. And it's the course, it's the, the million dollar question. I don't think anything really could have stopped Pearl Harbor, could have stopped the Japanese from doing what they did. It was too late. Um, they were determined. They, they were so determined. They were so fanatical that they were immune to logic, to facts, to to all the principles of diplomacy, mutual self-interest, uh, cooperation, compromise, trust, you know, <laughs> keeping your word about anything. So when, when, when facts get replaced by paranoia and Japan had a state media, which gave them only the news that the leadership wanted them to have, nothing from outside 
that it was a one one radio station. All the papers were controlled by this by the state. So the, the Japanese people were fed a, um, a stream of lies, misinformation, paranoia, um, hatred, resentment, and that leads to myopia. It leads to fanaticism. It leads to it finally it leads to a complete distortion of reality, and you can't you can't conduct diplomacy under those conditions. Now, what was Ambassador Gru? So he there were several times before Pearl Harbor where he he thought that conflict could I mean conflict did um, flare up, but um, the sinking of the the Panay, uh, for example, he thought war was coming. How much of a surprise was the bombing of Pearl Harbor to Ambassador Gru with him having lived in that kind of totalitarian, all-encompassing uh, media environment? How much of a surprise was it to him? Oh, I, I'm sure it was a surprise because he never gave up hope that he would be able to avert it. But once it happened, I don't think it... I mean, he, he, he warned the U.S. government it could be coming. So it, it wasn't a, a total shock. It was just he didn't know when it would happen. But he, he kept telling the government it will happen if we don't figure out a way to stop it somehow. So surprise, because it's always a surprise when somebody hits you in the face, even if, even if they're, um, they've got a, a boxing glove on, you know? Sure. Now, so Pearl Harbor happens. He... Ambassador Gru eventually does find out what what then uh, what then happens. Does he immediately leave the country? How, where does no, he go from they there? For nine, they were interned for nine months. The negotiations took place. They had a, a rougher deal than the Japanese diplomats who were interned in a country club, a resort in West Virginia. Uh, our 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 uh, embassy people stayed there. There was heat was only on several hours a day. They had enough food, but not an abundance of food. They were treated poorly by the uh, the Japanese police who were guarding them. So they made the best of it. And after nine months, the negotiations were complete. They got on a ship in June and started the trip. They started the trip to the United States. The Japanese got on a, a ship in the United States and they met in um, Mozambique, what is now Mozambique and the passengers on each ship got off and walked to the other ship and got on that ship. And, and that's how the exchange was made. So professionally, and then also personally, professionally, what impact did Pearl Harbor have on Ambassador Gru's uh, reputation as, as a diplomat? And then also what impact personally did, did the attack have on him? It's a good question. I, I think, well, when he came back, Secretary Hull sent him on a, a, a barnstorming tour around the country, 250 speeches in the first year, to, to talk about Japan and what Japan was like and what this regime was like. And, of course, they were everybody wanted to hear what Gru had to say because he was more familiar with the Japanese than just about any other American. And he told them that, first of all, don't don't get cocky because they're a small country. He said they're unbelievably tough. Second, this military cult has to be rooted out and destroyed or Japan will never return to the civilized nations. And third, please try to keep in mind that not everyone in Japan wanted this war, that some people did not want it. There are a lot of good people in Japan, people that he said, I love. That part of the speech eventually got cut at the request of the war office or for obvious reasons that didn't fit in with the propaganda. And then grew uh, after that, he was became head of the foreign desk, the, the Asia desk, rather, in the State Department. And then he became undersecretary of state and he served as acting secretary of state for often during the last year and a half or so of the war. He was involved in and helping to define the terms for the Potsdam meeting, where the terms for surrender were discussed with, Chir with Churchill, Truman, and Stalin and Chiang Kai-shek. Gru recommended and that the emperor be allowed to survive, if not Hirohito, at least 
the emperor as a as a concept, as a as a position in Japan, because he said, if you don't ensure that that will continue, they'll never surrender. Somehow between, well, what happened is that Alamogordo, New Mexico happened. We dropped the test bombs and it became clear that we were not going to have to invade Japan. So the, the provision about letting the emperorship survive got cut out of the Potsdam terms. And consequently, the Japanese refused to surrender. So we dropped the bomb, we dropped another bomb. And finally, they said, we will, of the emperor said, we'll surrender, but the emperorship has to continue. And Gru was involved in convincing, perhaps, the Secretary of State and Secretary of War, who were uh, making the, the final terms. He made it vague enough, they made it vague enough, so that the Japanese believed that the emperor would be allowed to remain somehow. And that's when they surrendered. So then personally, he never felt like a failure then. He not only did he feel like he did the best that he could do, but after Pearl Harbor, he continued to uh, to bring the war, not, maybe not to a close, but he continued to have an impact within the State Department for the war. Is that a yeah, fair? I think, so. I think that's, yeah, he's, he was a patriot. And so he wanted, he absolutely wanted to crush the Japanese military. But he also, as he said, um, it, it was his favorite post, his favorite country. He, he loved the Japanese and the Japanese culture. So it was, it was difficult. He, he, wanted, he was trying to do two things, get rid of, the, get rid of these fanatics and also remind Americans they, they can be our friends again. Uh, let's keep that in mind. There are good people there. And he never returned to Japan, which I think is pretty telling because the war ended in 1945. He didn't die until the 65. And so he could have gone back and he didn't. And he, he in one letter he, he wrote, uh, I, I didn't want to face my old friends as a conqueror, which I think is an interesting mm, yeah. point. Well, kind of my last question here, Steve, what, what lessons do you think diplomats, diplomats have to learn from Gru? Well, I suppose one is never succumb to the idea that war is inevitable, keep working, be empathetic to, uh, to the country where you're posted, despite what appears to be <laughs> many reasons why you should not be, because otherwise you won't make any progress. Uh, and third, keep in mind that no matter what you try to do, you still may fail if you run up against fanaticism, lies, misinformation, um, deceit. So diplomacy can only go so far. Gru knew that. He called it the, our first line of defense. But it can't, it can't solve everything. It can't, it's helpless against certain forms of totalitarian thinking. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for, for, for talking to me. Again, loved your book. Uh, everybody, Our Man in Tokyo uh, is the name of the book. Please go out. If you're like me, go to multiple libraries to find it, order it, buy it. It's really a, 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 a I think for, for one of the reasons that you said, Steve, Americans just don't know so much about the lead up to Pearl Harbor in Japan. Um, it was so fascinating to me to, to just learn about that. So, me too. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, Steve, where else, where, where can people find you? Are, are you on social media? Where, where can people get in touch or check out your work? I have a website. It's www.stevekemper.net. And there's information on there about the book and my other books. And there's other podcasts that I've done. People aren't sick of my voice at this point. They could hear, hear, some, <laughs> hear more of it there. Uh, I'm not on social media, so okay. uh, good for you. Yeah, wonderful. All right, well, um, thank you everybody for uh, for for listening, and uh, take care. Thanks. Thanks.